Would you turn in your Bibles with me to Numbers chapter 12, and I'll be reading uh, chapter 12, verses 1 through 3. Numbers chapter 12, verses 1 through 3. Then Miriam and Aaron spoke against Moses because of the Ethiopian woman whom he had married, for he had married an Ethiopian woman. So they said, Has the Lord indeed spoken only through Moses? Has, not, has he not spoken through us also? And the Lord heard it. Now the man Moses was very humble, more than all the men who were on the face of the earth. We'll come back to that text that David just read a moment ago, but I want to start the lesson actually with a, another passage uh, found over in the book of Micah, one of the minor prophets. Micah chapter 6 verse 4, and this gives you something of the importance of the individual that we'll be talking about tonight. Micah chapter 6 verse 4, and this is the Lord talking, and he says, for I brought you up from the land of Egypt. I redeemed you from the house of bondage. I set before you Moses, Aaron, and Miriam. Of course, this is talking about ancient history by the time of Micah, but you go back deep into your Old Testament, uh, and, and of course a part of that would be where David read a moment ago, and uh, you see the three great leaders of the Israelites, as they moved out uh, from uh, Egypt and moved toward the promised land, none other than Moses, Aaron, and the sister Miriam. Miriam is really one of the most important women in the Bible, and I want to talk about her tonight. I want you to follow with me as we go through a number of passages in the Old Testament and see a, a picture of a very interesting lady, and I believe, of course, has a great deal to say to us today and in modern America. And um, again, uh, a, a very prominent woman. Uh, she certainly uh, joins uh, her two brothers side by side in this passage in Micah, and you will see her leadership uh, throughout the time that we'll be talking uh, in, a, in, a, in a few moments. First of all, just some interesting points about her as we begin. And, and by the way, let me go over for sort of an introduction to her life to uh, Numbers chapter 26, verse 59. Numbers chapter 26, verse 59. And this is sort of a, what you might call an obituary, even though she's still alive at the time. But it's uh, very helpful in understanding uh, her family. Uh, from uh, Numbers uh, 26. The name of Amram's wife was Jochebed. Now that, uh, that gives you the parents of these three great heroes of Israel. Uh, Amram, not very famous and popular uh, in the uh, text, but obviously a very important man because uh, he is the father of these uh, very uh, important individuals. Amram's wife was Jochebed, and again, we know now the mother of Moses and the others, of course. The daughter of Levi, who was born uh, to Levi in Egypt, and Amram, she bore Aaron and Moses and his sister Miriam. And uh, to Aaron was born Nadab and Abihu, Eleazar and Ithamar. Uh, and uh, so you have family ties there. Uh, she is very interesting, uh, that is Miriam, because she is maybe the first woman we know of in Scripture that, what shall I say, worked outside the home. <laughs> she had a career beyond uh, family. And of course, you know in the ancient world that the the ideal, in fact, the, basically the only uh, occupation a, a woman of the ancient world would have had would be primarily a, a wife and mother. But uh, she is different in the sense that uh, she has a, a career uh, outside of the home and uh, is uh, very, very uh, effective in doing that. It, she, of course, uh, sort of precedes by a, a few years, to say the least, of of women today that have careers uh, outside the family relationships, and, and she's sort of leading the way with this. But um, she was a, the vanguard in this, uh, in this process. Also, it seems that she was unmarried. There's no indication that I can find in the sacred text that this woman had uh, a husband uh, and, and a family, uh, children. 
Uh, so she, apparently she chose to have uh, a, a, a life outside of the normal structures that we think about, especially in the ancient world. Uh, very, uh, very important that uh, she was, uh, by, by all accounts here, uh, unmarried. That might be, of course, for two reasons. Number one, she wanted to be totally committed to that career of being the, uh, one of these special leaders of God's people, and we can understand that. The career would come first. But then secondly, it may have been because what man would want to deal with a brilliant woman like this? I mean, can you imagine a suitor? You Can you imagine someone that would like to be her boyfriend? Uh, she is a brilliant individual. And uh, uh, probably most men would have been, uh, would have reacted or responded to her as like, uh, you know, I, I can't possibly reach the, the kind of intelligence this woman has. So very, very uh, bright and uh, uh, intelligent individual that uh, obviously demonstrates that as we move through her life in the, in the Old Testament. So uh, that we can say about her. And also that she was divinely called by God to do what she did. She didn't just simply step on the scene and say, I'm, I'm going to be a leader among God's people. And I direct your attention over to Exodus chapter 15, verse 20. Exodus chapter 15, verse 20. Uh, and I won't even read all of the passage because I'll come back to it later. In the first part of that verse, it says, Then Miriam the prophetess. Now, a prophet, of course, is a spokesman for God, and, and that certainly would indicate this is, is, this is a female person who spoke God's will, spoke by divine revelation uh, to, to the people. So again, a call by God uh, and, and uh, was uh, certainly not self-appointed for this because you can tell throughout uh, what she was doing, she had uh, the, uh, the authority from God to, to be doing what she was doing. So a prophetess among the people. In fact, she is the first woman mentioned in Scripture that's called a prophetess. So again, uh, one of these firsts that we have with this very interesting woman. Now then, let me share with you a couple of episodes that we know about her, and again, how we can see uh, how intelligent, how brilliant she was as an individual. The first uh, occasion is when she is just a young person, maybe a young uh, teenager, and uh, you uh, find uh, the passage that I want to deal with in Exodus chapter 2. Uh, Exodus chapter 2, and of course that's the very beginning of the book, and we have the, the uh, life of Moses involved in this, but also her part in uh, what happened to the baby Moses. Uh, and, and of course this is happening on the, on the uh, banks of the Nile River. Uh, and uh, the chapter begins, that is chapter 2, with the, the birth of Moses. And, and uh, the point is made, verse 2, he is a beautiful child. The mother, Jochebed, hid him for three months, but that can't, that can't continue. So she uh, took an ark of bulrushes, verse 3, and uh, made it so it would float and put it out in the Nile River among the, uh, among the reeds. Uh, to, to see what would happen. Well, sure enough, uh, it says in verse 4 that his sister, obviously Miriam, stood afar off to know what would be done to him. Now, there's no instructions, it seems, given just to, to see what would be the ultimate uh, conclusion of this rather desperate move to save the child by floating him out in the Nile River. Well, uh, verse 5 makes the point that the daughter of Pharaoh came down to bathe at the river and her uh, uh, servants, her maidens were with her and they discovered the, the uh, little uh, 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 ark. They opened it. Uh, the the uh, daughter of Pharaoh had compassion on him, verse 6 says. And then immediately you have this brilliant young girl. Now, now Think she's thinking about how can this be taken to our advantage and how can I save my baby brother? And so she is suddenly on the scene. She's watching and she sees that they've discovered the, the baby. And immediately, verse 7, she said to Pharaoh's daughter, Shall I go and call a, a nurse for you from the Hebrew women that she may nurse the child for you? Well, 
Pharaoh's daughter said to her, go. So the maiden went and called the child's mother. The mother, the very literal mother of Moses, was given the responsibility of raising that child. Probably my favorite of the biblical, Bible-related uh, movies is the Ten Commandments. I would imagine most of you have seen that one with Charlton Heston and uh, all-star cast. And uh, it's a very interesting, uh, a very interesting movie. And, and uh, if, if, you can, if you can stay with it for four hours or so, you've got it. Uh, but that, this is one of the places where uh, the dramatic license sort of takes you off a little bit from what literally happened. Uh, in the movie, uh, the uh, boy Moses does not realize all those years as he's raised uh, in Pharaoh's uh, court that uh, he is a Hebrew, that he really is a Jew. But then with a big dramatic moment and scene, it's made clear to him that he is indeed a Hebrew and uh, uh, not a true e Egyptian. Well, that's really not what this passage is saying. It says from the very beginning that Hebrews were involved and, and uh, he, he knows his mother and, and uh, knows all that information. So uh, we have here, though, this, this extremely wise and smart young girl taking the opportunity, seizing it, and making it possible for Moses, that little child, to be, born, to be raised by his own mother in Egypt, and then, of course, to come to, to great power in the uh, uh, later years as a part of the household of Pharaoh. Then there's another scene, and I want to go back uh, to uh, Exodus chapter 15 now. Exodus chapter 15, and I want to look at this um, episode. <coughs> this is at the side of another body of water. It's not the Nile River now, but it's the Red Sea. And uh, you know, of course, the great story of how the Israelites uh, escape and Pharaoh's army comes after them in, in this miraculous parting of the Red Sea and, and the, the Israelites make it across and, and then the, the Egyptians come roaring into that opening and then the water closes and uh, they are destroyed. Well, you find again this passage where I was looking a moment ago in, in Numbers chapter, or Exodus chapter 15, verse 20, and let me read that, and uh, verse 21 as well. Then Miriam the prophetess, the sister of Aaron, took the timbrel uh, in her hand and took the women, and all the women went out after her with uh, timbrels and with dances. Uh, and Miriam answered them, Sing to the Lord, for he has triumphed gloriously the horse and its rider he has thrown into the sea. So you have this woman joyously leading the women in this triumph after the, the um, uh, army of Pharaoh has been, been destroyed in the, in the Red Sea. In other words, she knows how to lead, number one. She knows uh, how to praise God and, and glorify God for what he has done. I, and I, I can't, I can't Im imagine us missing the point of leadership and in, in, in even in that realm. When we cannot recognize things to honor God, when we cannot praise God as he should be praised for his incredible blessing upon us, this woman knew to do that. She realized how important that was, and she led the other women in that uh, great uh, uh, group of Israelites in this triumphant song of victory. And uh, so, again, a, a brilliant woman understanding her place. And by the way, this is one of the first uh, poetic sections in all of Scripture. And apparently she wrote it. So we have, again, another first and another very important place uh, for uh, us to exalt uh, this woman. But now let me come to a tragic blot on her life. And we have to go to the text that uh, started with... Uh, David's reading a moment ago from Numbers chapter 12. Numbers chapter 12. And uh, let's look at that for a while. It starts out with a complaint. Now, the Jews have been complaining all along through the wilderness wanderings. But you don't expect it from the leaders, but all of a sudden, you have a leadership issue. And I, let me reread re some of this for emphasis. 
Then Miriam and Aaron spoke against or criticized Moses because of the Ethiopian, and some of your translations may say the, the Cushite woman. It would be basically the same, same thing. Uh, the uh, each, the uh, Ethiopian woman whom he had married, for he had married uh, this, this woman. Now that's the, let's say, the presented reason for their complaint. And uh, they start out with that. You know in earlier days, uh, Moses uh, married a woman named Zipporah. And uh, it could very well be that she's passed now off the scene, and uh, now he's remarried. It, seem, it, it seems by the thrust of the verse that he has taken her, or just taken her, as his uh, wife. And so uh, uh, there is that complaint. Uh, it would seem that there is here uh, a prejudice, could very well be a pre prejudice against the, the color of uh, her skin. Uh, Ethiopia would be a place for the darker skinned people, and it could be a, a very, very strong racial uh, issue or a, a skin color issue with uh, these two as they began this uh, attack upon Moses. But very quickly we understand that's just the beginning point. That's just the stated purpose to start the criticism. It reminds us of this classic example in John chapter 12, verses 4 through 6. You know, often in life there is the stated reason for something and then the real reason. In that passage in John 12, it's about Judas. And a woman did a very, very spectacular thing. A, 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 she she uh, anointed Jesus and, and broke uh, open a, 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 a perfume kind of ointment and... Uh, anointed the Lord, and, and Judas, of all people, complains about this, that this uh, could have been taken and, and we could have sold this for all kinds of money. I think the number is 200 denarii, which would have been a big sum of money. But our writer continues on with the incident and says, he didn't complain about this because of the money, because of, of what he can, talked about as waste, but he was a thief. And he wanted to get his hands on that. So there it was the stated reason. It's waste. But the real reason was he was a thief and wanted to have it himself. Well, here we start out with prejudice, apparently. We start out with uh, uh, a, a racial attack upon uh, the marriage. But then notice it goes farther. So they said, has the Lord indeed spoken only through Moses? Has he not spoken through us also? So you have here a couple of twins that really, really can be dangerous. Envy and ambition. We're just as important as he is, and we envy the place Moses has in this uh, leadership of God's people. Everybody would have known, yes, there were these three, very important, but number one, obviously, was this great man Moses. Well, these two are rebelling against that, and they, uh, they present their complaint. And, and of course, uh, the, it was a power play, if you will, very modern, very, very up-to-date, is it not, when people uh, want more power, take possession of more. And I think most of us understand that that's what politics is. It's not necessarily a matter of possessions and making a lot of money. People want power. And uh, these two wanted a position of greater power in relationship to Moses, and so uh, they're complaining about this. It is interesting, as you look at it, that uh, the Lord deals with it in a very, very striking way. And notice in verse 3, Now the man Moses was very humble, more than all men who were on the face of the earth. That is given just after the challenge to his authority which seemed to indicate that rather than Moses dealing directly with these two that were rebelling against his position, God would take care of it. Moses will not need to t say, you know, I'm really over you I'm, as far as the, the authority and power. But uh, the Lord will take care of this. And then fact, next, uh, the, verse 4, Suddenly the Lord said to Moses, Aaron, and Miriam, Come out, you three, to the tabernacle of meeting. And so they go. And the Lord makes a point, and I won't read all of it, but he makes this point. I have prophets. I have people that have visions and, and see 
uh, what I want them to communicate, and they do that. But Moses in is, a, is in a totally different realm. He's not like an ordinary prophet or, or a visionary. And ver, uh, verse 8, the Lord says, I speak with him face to face even plainly and not in dark sayings. In other words, not in like I would speak to a lot of human beings. And then he closes with verse 8. Why then were you not afraid to speak against my servant Moses? Well, the anger of the Lord, verse 9, was aroused against them and he departed. And then it says that Miriam became leprous as white as snow. Now here's a question. It doesn't seem at all that Aaron, uh, Aaron has any bad consequences. And I'm, I mean in the sense of Miriam has turned into a leper. What, what, what's going on there? Well, it is obvious that, that uh, Miriam is the leader in this. Notice uh, at the very beginning of the chapter, then Miriam and Aaron. Okay, that's her leadership position. He goes, she goes first. And the Hebrew verb for what happens there is singular and feminine. In other words, when it says Miriam and Aaron spoke against Moses, it would be saying Miriam, she spoke, a singular feminine form of a verb. So it's obvious that she is the one leading this rebellion against Moses. And therefore, with the punishment especially in mind, uh, she is the... Uh, the instigator and the, uh, the, the moving force behind this. And uh, of course, uh, becoming a leper is a death sentence, not a, not a quick death, but uh, an excruciating death. And uh, then what do we do? I'm glad to tell you that her story ends in a very good way. It ends just like our stories must end. And that is by an understanding that we need God's help. Aaron, of course, realizes immediately that this was a wrong, wrong course of action. And uh, Aaron says to Moses, we have sinned. And we come back to a right relationship to God with that same kind of attitude. We've sinned. And we need help. Well, what do we, what, what do, we do? Well, you have Aaron pleading. Verse 12, please do not let her be as the dead whose flesh are consumed. Uh, when he, uh, and, 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 of course, that's what happens with lepers. It, it's a horrible, slow, excruciating death. Don't let this happen to Miriam. And so immediately Moses cried out to the Lord, Please heal her, O God, I pray. Now I want you to think about that and, and, and think how wonderful that expresses the attitude of Moses. And for us. You know, he, he prefigures that one that died on the cross, the one that talked about very, very uh, relevant things in, in the Sermon on the Mount, in Matthew chapter 5, and you remember, uh, he says, Bless them that curse you. Pray for them that despitefully use you. That's our Lord. But here is Moses 1,500 years later praying for a woman that seems if she had her way, would have usurped the authority of her brother Moses and would have done no telling what in the name of, of uh, her authority in, in guiding the nation. But uh, it was not to be. And this uh, Moses immediately, without resentment, there's no indication that he hesitated for a moment in saying, let's make this right and let's pray to God that it will be taken care of. And sure enough, uh, it happens, beginning with verse 14, uh, the, the Lord says he will heal her, but she needs to be seven days outside the camp. Again, as a reminder in all probability that, that this was not a good thing, it was not the right thing to do. But then later on, uh, she is brought back into the camp and as far as we know, continues her life of service uh, for God's people. And, and uh, my last passage with her in mind is found in uh, Numbers chapter 20, verse 1. Then the children of Israel, the whole congregation, came into the wilderness, wilderness of Zin in the first month, and the people stayed at Kadesh. And Miriam died there and was buried there. So her story ends, and I would suggest to you, in a beautiful way. 
Number one, because she would learn her lesson and would have the forgiveness that comes from God and the healing process that would come from the God of healing. So she presents a wonderful series of lessons for us today. I want to ask you as we close the lesson what kind of position you have with the Lord. Uh, Here's one with all kinds of talent and ability. Here's one that could do great things and did in the Lord's service. She was not perfect, and at a crucial moment, she challenged the very thing that I would say is the major problem in the religious world today. Authority. Authority. And we, we need to be doing things by the authority of God, not by what we want. In fact, notice the challenge to authority was rebellion. Now, it may not be in our time a rebellion that, you know, shakes its fist at God and uh, uh, says ugly and mean things in the face of God, but authority, but, but a rebellion that says, I know what God says do, but I'm not going to do it. Now, that's the same kind of spirit that you find in this tragic incident of this great woman's life. In the authority of the Lord, he commands obedience from us. He commands that we be become his children in, in a very special way. We, we trust in him. We believe in him. We turn our hearts over to him in, in a strong, committed faith that he is the son of God. We repent and turn, our sin, turn from our sins and say, I'm changing my life. I'm turning to God. And we confess our faith in him. And then we, because he demands it, because he commands it, we are baptized, immersed in water for the remission of our sins. If you're subject to the invitation this evening, won't you come while together we stand and sing?